Our first scripture lesson for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4 of the New Revised Standard Version. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches of Galatia. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you earn, so that collections need not be taken when I come. And when I arrive, I will send any whom you approve with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. May God bless our reading and hearing of the scripture. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes to us from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, <clears throat> verses 12 through 31. It is a lengthy lesson, but there's really not a good place to cut it off, so uh, we're going to read the whole thing. As I read, listen for the word of God. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now. You are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophet, third teachers, then deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. May God bless the reading and the hearing of the Scripture. We've heard it before, right? We sang about it during the first uh, hymn. You know, many gifts, one spirit that we are one body together in Christ Jesus. And we hear it over and over and over again as Christians, we are, we, we are one body. But what happens is that sometimes I think we are a little narrow with our view of church. We understand that we are one body in Christ Jesus. But that probably just means us gathered here, right? Just, just, just us. Or maybe, maybe it just means, maybe it just means, um, you know, First United Methodist in Norfolk, Nebraska. Maybe that's what it means. Maybe that's what it means to, 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 to be the body of Christ, to, to be this one congregation. In fact, sometimes we don't even think about the body of Christ as a body. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking about the body of Christ as a building. You know? Oh, this. This is First United Methodist Church, Norfolk, Kansas, right? The bricks, the mortar, the wood? No. 
This building isn't a church. This building is a tool that the church uses for the purpose of spreading the gospel, for the transformation of the world. It's a tool. It's not the church. You are the church. I am the church. We are the church together. One body. We have different purposes. We have different ways of working, but we are one body. But not just we who gather here. It's, the church is bigger than us. You know, we're going to be real aware of that over the next few years. Now that Winside and Stanton have kind of been included in to the relationship here. You know? Diaz couldn't find anybody to serve a part-time associate position. The Diaz couldn't find anybody to serve a part-time charge on the edge of town. What did the Diaz do? Put them together. And so now we are together in, in a new relationship, a new experiment, and you may be thinking to yourself, I have no idea how that's going to work. And that's okay because neither do I. But we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out because we are the body of Christ and we are more than ourselves. We are the, we are the sum of our members plus the power of the Spirit. It's not about just we who gather here. The church is bigger than us. Now, the reason for the first lesson this morning, the reminder about the collection for the saints in Jerusalem, is another piece of this covenant connection that we talk about. See, we're connected to one another in this, chair, in this place, and we know that churches are connected to one another. But this covenant connection that we live in as United Methodists, well, it means that we're connected financially to one another as well. You know, new preachers have only been here two Sundays and they're already talking about money, right? But we're not talking about how you give. We're talking about how we give. That we United Methodists, we're a covenant connection. We, we, we are connected one to another. And so when we collect... We collect also for needs beyond our own community. Uh, we have these things we call apportionments. We've changed the name recently. We've started referring to them as mission shares, trying to make them sound a little more palatable. Um, I don't know that either one really matters. It's either our share of the mission and ministry of the uh, annual conference, or it's a portion of the mission and ministry of the annual conference, but either way, it's, it's our fair share of what the larger church is doing. Why? Well, because we can't do it all on our own. I mean, think about it. How many times have you over the years put a little money in the plate for UMCOR? Yeah? How many times have you, um, you know, given to the one great hour of sharing, which now we call UMCOR Sunday? How many times have you given to that for UMCOR? How many times have you taken up a special offering because somebody, you know, has suffered an earthquake or a tornado or there's a war-torn country someplace? How often have you done that? And then now, how have those funds found their way back into Nebraska to help your friends, your neighbors, maybe even your family in times of natural disaster and in times of need. Well, that's who we are. We're a covenant connection. And what that means is that we do our best to take care of others when they're in need and when our turn comes, we trust that they will do their best to help take care of us in our time of need. The apportionments, mission shares, whatever we want to call them, those are really important to the Gately family. Let me just tell you up front that that is a, a priority for us. And I'll look at just one topic, and that is campus ministry. It's one of those things that, well, we can't do as well on our own as we can do together. And so when I went to college, I had met the campus minister at summer camp. And so I hit the university and what did I do? I went looking for the Wesley Foundation. 
I went to the Wesley Foundation at Arkansas State University. My second year there, Bridget walks in. She wasn't United Methodist at the time, but she was looking for a family and a community. And so that's where we met each other. That's really when we, where we came to start to understand our calling to Christian service. The campus minister, to be real honest, he schnookered me. He had me preaching every time he wasn't available. He had me helping him serve communion. He had me doing all of these pastoral type things so that when I got out of school, I'm like, wait a minute, that's not what lay people do. That's not my job. And so I go into ordained ministry. Now, eventually, Bridget and I find ourselves in Topeka, Kansas. In Topeka, Kansas, we serve Grace United Methodist Church, which is first church of the Evangelical Association, then Grace EUB, then Grace UMC. So it's one of the German-speaking Methodist churches, historically. We serve there, and then we serve at, as campus ministers at Washburn University. Now, that was really freaky because my dad was a Washburn graduate. I grew up in Arkansas, and I remember leaving going, what is an Ichabod, you know? And most of you are going, Ichabod, what is that? Because you don't understand either because you're from Nebraska. It, it's, it's a weird mascot, but that's their mascot, the Ichabods. I learned what it was because I was campus minister there with Bridget for nine years. We were paid through the apportionments to be campus ministers. Now, our children, our children, for some reason, grew up as preacher's kids and didn't hate the church. And that we consider to be a real accomplishment on our part. Because so many times they do resent the church for, for uh, all the times that mom and dad weren't available. But we, uh, our son, he always wanted to go to Washburn. He was a preteen when we were there. And that's kind of where he had always visioned going. He went to Washburn, graduated from Washburn. He... Um, he was on staff at that campus ministry. And so he was ministered to by those apportionment dollars and ultimately got paid his part-time little student salary from those. Our daughter, our daughter went to Arkansas State University. She went to our alma mater. She was able to get in-state tuition because she's a legacy. And she was well scholarshiped, and so that's where she went. She tried not to go to the Wesley Foundation. She went, she, went there, she went there once and she came back and she said, Dad, they're all weird. And I said, that's because it's a campus ministry. It's always that way. I heard her kind of talking to a group of high school students a couple years later and she, re she reiterated that same story. She said, you know what? I still think they're all weird. They're just my kind of weird. And so Erin is at the very campus ministry where we were. She worships in the building where we worshiped. She, she met her husband where Bridget and I met at the Wesley Foundation. It, it, is, it, is, it is a place that, that, that had great meaning for us. And ultimately, ultimately, her senior year, she was paid to be the praise band leader of the praise band that Bridget and I started when we were in college. That's connection. That's connection. We never, we never wanted our son to go to Washburn. In fact, we really wanted him to look at some other places. We wanted him to start out in Juco, to be honest with you, because our daughter, she graduated, she graduated in four years, uh, university honors, magna cum laude. Our son graduated in six years, thank the laude, you know? You know, and, and yet they both found their place as different as they were in campus ministries where they belonged. Another thing about this covenant connection beyond the way that we can do ministry beyond ourselves, you know, more than, than just the fact that we can do campus ministry and we can do disaster relief and we can do all these other things together that we can't do on our own. There's also just those extended relationships. You see, this week, Bridget and I went out to eat lunch with a colleague of ours. Now, our clergy colleagues, we're really tight with some of them. Our closest friends are some of our clergy colleagues. 
there's a group of, of, of four clergy couples that we are siblings to one another. We are extended family, and we are extended family of choice, and, and we're like siblings. Our children often refer to them as aunts and uncles, except for one, they refer to her as mom too. These are, these are family of choice. These are people that we love and are close to, this tightest circle of friends. And then there's a second circle of friends around it. These are, these are really close friends. They're, they're not familial yet, but they're really, really close friends. And so literally, they are like our cousins because, because well, John and Jenny are in this inner circle, but then these friends, Shelly and Dustin, are the literal in-laws of John and Jenny. Jenny and, and Shelly are sisters. And so we had lunch with Shelly this week. And, you know, that's not an unusual thing. We, we didn't get a chance to have lunch with her at annual conference. We usually eat lunch with Shelly and Dustin at some point during annual conference because we're in a connection, we're in a covenant. And in fact, our membership Bridget and I and Dustin and Shelley and John and Jenny, we don't belong to a local church. Our membership is in the Great Plains Annual Conference. And so they literally are our fellow church members. Now, part of the reason I tell you that is that you need to know that it's a really, really bad idea to talk trash about former pastors. <laughs> because we all know each other. We, we need to understand that faith, Christianity, our walk is not something we do alone. Now, we have to take accountability for it ourselves, and we have to take responsibility for it ourselves, and we, we have to accept it for ourselves, but in terms of living it out, we don't live it out by ourselves. We live it out in communion with one another. We live it out as the body of Christ. Because, Neil, without you, well, that's incomplete. And you without Stanton and Windside and Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City and Garden City First, and well, that's incomplete. There's more we can do together than we can do on our own. And that's even shown in our liturgy when we bring people into the church. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to it, but when we bring people into the church, we ask different levels of questions. First thing we ask them to do is to profess faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you've already professed faith in Jesus Christ, we don't ask you to do that because you've already done it. Next thing we do is we ask you to join the church universal. The next thing we ask you to do is to join the United Methodist Church and then finally, the local congregation. And if you come transferring from another tradition, we're going to pick up where we left off. So if you are transferring from another United Methodist Church, we're simply going to say, as faithful members of the United Methodist Church, we ask you this one question. Will you support Norfolk First United Methodist Church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If somebody's Presbyterian, we back it up a notch. We ask them to join the United Methodist Church, and we ask them about the local congregation. I have confirmed a 37-year-old woman because she was baptized as an infant but never confirmed as a youth. Well, we didn't rebaptize her. We picked up as if she was a 13-year-old being confirmed and carried it on because we understand that the church doesn't exist unto itself. The church exists in relationship with other churches. And so we as individuals and we as congregations, we join together to be the body of Christ. This week, you have a chance to be the body of Christ. You have a chance to help support the church through its ministry with young people through Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School cannot be pulled off without the congregation. It is an all-hands-on-deck project. And we know what happens. What happens is that people will say, well... I would have helped if someone would have asked me. It was in the bulletin for two months, announced from the pulpit for three weeks, but somehow we didn't get asked. We are responsible 
as members of the church, as members of the body of Christ, we are responsible for continuing and growing that body and making sure that the children of this community know that God loves them. And so do we. Amen.